Well, this is a first for me, first time here, first speaking in this manner to so many people about uh, prevention and food in cardiology. And also the first time I've ever been live on the internet, so it's a little, a little daunting here. Um, I'm gonna talk about uh, why, why food is so important in prevention of heart attack and stroke. You've heard about the what. Uh, Dr. Deal was here in the first uh, session and you saw him many times ask, what is plant-based eating? And he asked you to respond. He said it was whole grains, legumes, fruits and nuts. Uh, the, the how of plant-based eating you get from these wonderful demonstrations every evening and the uh, recipe book that was prepared for you all for, for free, gratis. And I just want to congratulate Susan and John on a, a meeting like this. I know how hard meetings are to put on. Uh, I know the effort that goes into producing something like this. It's an extraordinary accomplishment. There are conferences in Southern California that cost several hundred to a thousand dollars to attend, and here this is as a community service. And you really should be congratulated. <clears throat> so, at the conclusion of this discussion, I hope you'll come away with uh, five key points that you'll remember. First, that heart attack and stroke can be prevented by screening people in midlife, primarily by imaging arteries, which I'll show you, all men by age 45, women by 55. And that if you know the significance of three numbers, 25%, 50%, 75%, you will know that real food and lifestyle are the most important treatments in prevention of, of heart disease. And we'll go over these during our hour together. And you can be confident and be an advocate to your families, your friends, uh, your communities in spreading the word about how to live better, healthier lives. Now, the nutrition literature talks about the diet that most of us eat as the Western diet. Uh, as though it's a European and an American commonality. I like standard American diet because the standard American diet is sad. Um, and I use, I use that a lot. Uh, so every year the American Heart Association, American College of Cardiology uh, get together and publish the statistics about how many heart attacks and strokes have occurred and what we're doing to combat it. And these are the numbers for 2018. Buried in the fine print is another statistic that I think is the most important. And that's of heart attacks, 75%, that number, are first ever heart attacks. 75% of strokes are first ever events. The person didn't know that the arteries were diseased for decades, had no warning, didn't know that today would be a day they were in the hospital. And that's what our efforts are all about. We emphasize screening of everyone with very simple tests that I'll show you, very inexpensive tests. Um, and the point is when to do it. If you look at the retirement age at 65, 50% of the heart attacks and coronary events have already occurred in men, a third have occurred already in women. If you look at 55, a quarter of the events have already occurred in men. So the Society for Heart Attack Prevention and Eradication, of which we are a clinical center, recommends screening all men at 45, all women at 55 or earlier if there are risk factors, like a family history or smoking or diabetes. Now, an admission. Doctors really are dummies about diet. Uh, we are not, the, in general, the best source of information about how you should eat to prevent disease. And this is because we don't get taught almost anything about it when we're in medical school. 
we get very little mentoring or training when we're in our postgraduate studies. Uh, <clears throat> we get taught about the anatomy and patho pathophysiology of the GI tract, but not what to put in it. Um, there are no professors of nutrition and cardiology. Uh, there, are, there is no academic advancement uh, if you're studying nutrition and cardiology. There's no glory in grains, so to speak. There's, there's no uh, funding for research in cardiology uh, on, on prevention in this manner. Uh, there are no bucks and beans. So it's not surprising that doctors view our role as diagnosing a condition and then dispensing pills and procedures to deal with it after the fact, which is still what most of us do. And there is little interest or less interest in prevention. As witness to that, here's a blogger from the recent ESC meetings, the European Society of Cardiology meeting in Munich uh, last month. 31,000 cardiologists and industry people in attendance. The biggest headlines are always about the late-breaking clinical trials, the new things about pills and procedures. And on the left is a, a large auditorium with doctors trying to get in, 3,500 seats, standing room only, a line trying to push in to hear the latest in pills and procedures. On the right is a meeting about prevention. Later in the day, smaller venue, empty seats, people are falling asleep, one guy trying to stay awake, people checking their cell phones. This is, this is the sad state of affairs. So how did this doctor become a convert? Well, we learn much more from our patients over the years than we ever learn in school. Uh, and I was converted by a patient named Alan, who came to our practice Oh, about six years ago, sent by his internist because he had an elevated cholesterol and hypertension. And as he said, he was a health nut, meaning to him he would prefer not to take medicines uh, and try to do his best with his lifestyle. So we said, okay, we'll go with you. We'll, we'll see how you will do. And as usual, I dug into his history and found a CT scan that had been done uh, two years before for another reason, for an abdominal complaint. It was a CT scan from here to here. Uh, and he had calcification in his arteries everywhere. It was in his femoral arteries, his abdominal aorta, his thoracic aorta, his coronary arteries. And I had a serious talk with him, and he, he said he would still prefer to do it on his own. Shortly thereafter, he developed some chest pain and he had to have an angiogram after flunking a stress test, and he had to have a stent. And he was started on a statin drug, which is the proper thing to do. He came back to see me and said, uh, Dr. Ta, have you ever heard of a Dr. Caldwell Esselstyn? I said, funny name, uh, in my head. Uh, and uh, I said, no. He said, well, he wrote this book called Prevent and Reverse Heart Disease. And I said, oh, there's another one of those <laughs> in my head. Um, and he said, you know, he was a cancer surgeon at the Cleveland Clinic who did a study on end-stage heart patients and proved that, that although they were told they had only one or two years to live, they all could live a long time. And I said to myself, uh, Cleveland Clinic? the number one cardiac surgery program in the world. Great reputation. Why would a cancer surgeon, you know, do a study like this? So I immediately went to my computer, Amazon, Esselstyn, uh, look inside, you know, that feature on Amazon. You see a few pages, click, and read the book. Uh, and Dr. Esselstyn's contribution was totally unique. I'll tell you why. But now I'm roughly 65 books in, uh, 1,500 to 2,000 papers in filing cabinets around my office. I would consider myself to be a homeschooled, uh, maybe master's degree, if not PhD, in, in cardiology and nutrition. Um, 
Dr. Esselstyn's study was done and published, I think, in 1995, uh, his original study. And what he was interested in was the epidemiology of breast cancer. Uh, it varies around the world. In India, it's maybe a tenth of what it was here in the United States, Africa, India as well. Um, and he, uh, he was curious about the difference, and it was clearly diet, uh, clearly a difference in diet. And he proposed to do a study in women where he controlled their diets for 10 years against a control group. And he realized, well, he would need 10 or 20,000 women. And he'd have to control their diets. It was impossible on his face. And since coronary heart disease, heart attack, tracks with cancer, he went to the cardiology department and said, give me the worst of your patients. Give me those who are at the end stage. They're facing their third bypass operation. They're inoperable. They're having chronic angina. So. Uh, they did. Uh, he created a diet along with his wife, who was very key in, in the research. He met with these people every week. Uh, he had support groups that uh, encouraged his patients to comply with the diet. And when he published his results, I think about 12 years later, uh, out of the 28 patients, the 18 who complied with the diet, one dropped out and after six months, had a stent, went back in and survived the ones who, who dropped out all passed away. And let's see here. There we go. Um, his contribution was different in that everybody who preceded him had destination, time-consuming, extremely expensive ways of dealing with disease, coronary heart disease, and he found a way to do it with individual patients in a regular practice like mine. Uh, there was a Dr. Walter Kempner in the 1940s who treated obese patients with kidney failure, malignant hypertension, uh, with a rice diet. Some of you, I, uh, I'm sure, have heard of this. He, they would come and live at Duke University in sort of Quonset huts and be fed twice a day a diet consisting of rice, a little bit of fruit, and maybe some protein. There were no drugs for these conditions in those days. They lost weight, their uh, renal disease improved, their diabetes improved, heart failure went away, the eye disease of diabetes improved, the neuropathy, which is so terrible in diabetes, got better. He documented all this with other physicians at Duke. He presented it in New York to an AMA meeting, and everybody went, no. No, these, these images are reversed. This was before and not after. He wasn't believed. But the, the rice diet survives there even to this day. Nathan Pritikin on the top right was well known to us in Santa Monica for the Longevity Center, which was at what is now the Casa Del Mar uh, Hotel. I'm sure some of you know that. He, he was there in the late 70s and early 80s, a 28-day experience where people were Diet was controlled, supervised exercise, and health improved. Dean Ornish in the lower left did a study very similar to what Dr. Esselstyn did and showed that you could actually re regress some coronary lesions. Dr. Esselstyn I was able to meet uh, about a year later after Alan uh, at a conference here in Southern California, and if any of you ever heard him speak, he's a very gracious, uh, kindly gentleman, very encouraging of what I wanted to do. And he said one thing that I will always rem remember. He said, I found the most valuable thing I could give my patients was my time and my full attention. And if I did that, they would believe and they would be healed. Uh, and I think that's such a simple lesson, but the key to his success in treating patients in a regular practice without extra expense uh, in the real world. Now, oh yeah, there we go. A little bit about atherosclerosis. It is a progressive disease that starts, whoop, It starts early in life, 
in the walls of arteries. Uh, they become inflamed, uh, they be become narrowed, uh, and these lesions grow over time until at some point they actually can rupture uh, with, with necrotic debris entering the bloodstream and causing a clot occluding an artery to part of your brain or part of your heart, stroke and heart attack. Uh, and prevention in cardiology has almost always been what we call secondary prevention, meaning after the fact. After the heart attack, after the stroke, a lot of things can be done, a lot of procedures, a lot of pills can be given. But where we work is here. We're trying to find the earliest signs of disease and tell people what to do to prevent all that. That's primary prevention. The ultimate goal is getting information like this out to everyone so that we have primordial prevention. We prevent people from getting high blood pressure. We, we make sure they never smoke. We make sure their cholesterol stays low by the choices in the, in the foods they eat. The crux of all this is cholesterol. Those people who say cholesterol is involved, not so. Cholesterol and triglycerides are carried in the bloodstream in little packets made by the liver. This is the HDL and LDL that's measured in your blood that I'm sure many of you are aware of. And these, these particles transport these substances to various locations around your body. There's nothing really wrong with that. Various amounts of triglycerides and cholesterol ester are inside these particles because they're fats and they're not soluble in liquid blood. But the outside of the particle is soluble and carries them to places where they are used. On the surface of these particles are proteins, particularly one bad actor, which is apolipoprotein B. And what happens is that protein in the wall of the artery uh, initiates an early inflammatory and immune response, then inflammation, uh, then necrosis, breakdown of tissues, uh, destruction of the smooth muscle that's there in the artery, uh, accumulation of scar tissue, fibrous tissue, deposition of calcium, and the thing grows and grows and eventually can be narrow enough to cause coronary insufficiency, angina, or a heart attack. So, a little bit about the, the heart and the pathology of this. This is a heart as it looks in the body, and you'll notice the first thing about it, it's covered in fat. And the fatter you are, the more fat around your heart, and the inflammation in that fat is part of the process as well. But if a cardiac surgeon wants to do a bypass from the aorta here with a vein or artery down to the left anterior descending artery here, they gotta dig through fat. Uh, now, just for orientation, the arteries that supply the working muscle of the heart of the coronary arteries Here's the aortic valve, which is the last valve before arterial blood is, is pumped out to your body. The right coronary artery, which is on your left here, looking at the front of someone's chest, comes off here, just above the leaflets, goes around to the back of the heart. I'll show you some real images of this in a minute. The left main coronary artery comes out on the left and divides into two major branches. This is the left anterior descending. That's the circumflex. This is what your aorta and your leaflets, your aortic valve leaflets look like when they're normal early in life. The aorta has been parted here and opened. This is called the non-coronary aortic cusp. This is the left coronary cusp, nice and delicate. Three leaflets opening and closing, opening and closing, sealing perfectly. And this opening here is the left main coronary artery. That's what the aorta looks like with atherosclerosis. And the rest of, of, the, of the aorta can look the same. Lumpy, bumpy, yellow, fibrous tissue, calcium deposition. You can see that the aortic leaflets are deformed and right there is the opening of the left main coronary artery and it's filled 
with cholesterol and debris. Now, here's a specimen with the fat removed and the surrounding tissue removed to show the leaflets of the aorta, the left main coronary artery, and the left anterior descending coronary artery. This is the opening that's left. You see that narrow channel there? All of this stuff here is plaque in the wall of the arteries. All the white part of it is calcium deposition. And this is how it looks early on. If you transect these arteries, this is supposed to be one cell layer thick. And here's all of this material circumferentially in the artery. Here's a lot more of it, very irregular necrotic material, eccentric, eccentrically placed. Here, one of the pl plaques is ruptured. Actually, there are two plaques here. This one and another one grew on top of it. There's more material over here. And you've seen a rupture here with all of this material entering the bloodstream and causing a clot resulting eventually in complete occlusion of the artery with a lot of scar tissue and calcification. How can we discover this in life? How can we diagnose this? Well, this is a patient who came to see me from Kaiser. He wanted a second opinion about the recommendation for bypass surgery. And he wanted to know, could he prevent it? Uh, and if he had to have surgery, could he do preventive things afterwards so he'd never have to do it again? Uh, this is a catheter in the aorta coming around through the aortic valve, which I showed you, into the cavity of the left ventricle. Contrast materials injected looks like water. It's got iodine. It looks dark on an x-ray. And this is the heart relaxed. That's the heart contracted fully. And this is normal. All the wall motion is, is normal here. He's not had any damage so far. And this is a couple of frames from his angiogram. Here is the right coronary artery, which I showed you winding around the back of the heart. And I think you pretty easily see he's got a big problem right there. Very thready channel. Over here on the left side, there's another problem here. In the left main, here's the division. He's got a problem there. He had five different places where this was present. He had a lot of symptoms. He needed his bypass surgery, which he got. And then a program of prevention, which he's on now. We can make images of other arteries very easily with ultrasound. This sort of looks like something later in the month that you'd put on your front door. But it's a CT scan, two CT scans, actually a CT angiogram imposed on a CT of head, neck, and shoulders. Here's, here's the heart, here are arteries to the arms, here's an artery that goes up to the brain, the, the common carotid artery, and the carotid artery bifurcates into an artery that goes to the outside of your head, the face, and to the, and to the brain. You can easily make images of this. Um, Here's a patient lying down. The head is here, the feet are here. Here's a transducer over the neck, over the carotid artery. Here's the branch that goes to the external. Here's the branch that goes to the internal. And this is a very common place to find plaque. We do this three, times a, three days a week. We have patients getting this imaging. Here's a common carotid artery. And look how thick this material is. Look how narrow we can image flow going through with ultrasound. That's 50 to 70% narrowed by plaque right under the skin, easy to find to make a diagnosis that someone has atherosclerosis. Another thing we can do is, is uh, coronary calcium scoring. Uh, this is a simple CT scan. You lie down, hold your breath for 20 seconds, and a quick CT is done, slicing through the chest. Uh, and sort of like cutting a tomato, slicing a tomato every three millimeters and looking at it from the side and seeing if there's any calcification in coronary arteries. The heart, this is, these are, this is from another patient of mine. Here's the chest. You can see the calcium in all the, all the ribs. Here's the spine. There's the sternum. All of this should be the same consistency. And here and here you see calcium. And another slice, you see more calcium. These are very calcified 
coronary arteries. So how do we do screening? How do we find out if you have early atherosclerosis and should be worried? Well, we do a lot of screening for cancer, anatomic screening. You go to the dermatologist looking for melanoma and basal cell carcinoma. Uh, women get breast imaging for breast cancer. Men get digital rectal exams and PSAs for prostate cancer, and now MRIs in some cases. We do endoscopy for colon. We do blood tests looking for blood-borne cancers. Anatomic screening for early disease, very accepted but not yet accepted for coronary artery disease and stroke, despite the fact they're the biggest killers around the world. And it's foolish because it is so simple and so easy and so cheap. Now, screening studies for subclinical, we call it subclinical atherosclerosis because there's no clinical manifestation as yet. And uh, there have been a number of studies over the years looking at this kind of imaging in thousands of patients and finding out how predictive it is. The most local study here is the multi-ethnic study of atherosclerosis, MESA. One of the principal investigators is in Torrance, maybe five, 10 miles from here at Harbor UCLA Medical Center. Uh, these patients, uh, multiple ethnicities, Caucasian, Black, Hispanic, and Asian, have been tracked now for about 15 years. We know what they're imaging studies mean as far as future events. Here is uh, one study that was the Aragon Workers' Health Study done in Spain at a GM uh, automobile assembly plant where thousands of workers were tested. Did it work? I know they had trouble with this before. And you can see that even in people who had no risk factors, they didn't have hypertension, they didn't have diabetes, their cholesterol was considered normal, they didn't smoke. Of the 50-year-old males who worked at that plant, over half of them had some plaque somewhere, and the femoral area was, was number one. The more risk factors you have, the greater likelihood that you'll have plaque and calcification somewhere. Here's the Aragon worker study. This is another study from Spain of a, a group of bank employees. Uh, and they were studied as well. Between a quarter and a little over a third of them all had calcification in their coronary arteries. And half of them had plaque in the femoral area and aorta and about a third in their neck. All of these people need attention and need to be counseled about how to live their lives dis differently. And it tracked with cholesterol. This is LDL cholesterol and, and the number of sites that had atherosclerosis. And if you're fortunate enough to keep the LDL cholesterol you're born with, which is 50 to 60, very few people did this in this study, there was no plaque anywhere. The higher the LDL, cholesterol here, 150, the more sites that you had plaque. Okay, now I have to tell you a somewhat painful story. Uh, but the story of Stuart illustrates several things. Um, it illustrates residual risk, that despite pills and procedures, there is still risk going forward. Patients and doctors both have unrealistic expectations about how much you get out of administering medications for disease. This includes hypertension, diabetes, cholesterol. If you ask patients who are given a statin drug what benefit they think they're going to get from it, almost all of them think it's over 50 percent, and it's not, it's half that. Same is true for diabetes and hypertension. We're mitigating the disease, but we're not completely eliminating the risk. Stewart came to us when he was 51 years old. He had some symptoms. He'd had a silent heart attack, and he needed an angiogram and had a stent, but he had a terrible past history. His family history was frightening. His father had a heart attack at 39, died at 47. Stewart smoked 
for, from age 20 to 51, he had an elevated cholesterol and hypertension. And prior to when we met him, he had a coronary artery calcium scan, and he had a very high score. His doctors had started him on statin drugs. He had a clot in his leg later, and was on blood thinners and blood pressure medicines. Despite that, he got in trouble at age 51. And shortly thereafter, he had continuing symptoms, needed a bypass graft, bypass grafts done. He didn't do well after the surgery. His blood thinner had to be stopped for the surgery, obviously. He developed a new clot in his legs and pulmonary emboli clots to his lungs. After he got out of the hospital, uh, he had signs of congestive heart failure. His heart was weak. And an angiogram was done, and his, all of his vein grafts were closed. He was found to have a rare mutation of clotting that made it more likely that his veins would clot. And on and on it goes at age 56, 63, 67, more and more trouble, despite the best efforts of all of us. But he was on a sad diet, and he didn't want to change it. He stopped smoking at 51, but not really, not completely. And so he had more angiograms, more stents, eventually had a redo bypass, and his heart was so bad with irregular rhythms, he had a bypass, he had a pacemaker and defibrillator implanted. In the end, he was on eight cardiovascular medicines, 18 total medicines. He had eight angiograms, 10 stents, two bypasses, and a pacemaker defibrillator, and he didn't survive. So there is residual risk. The pills and procedures buy time. We bought him years. But what if, when he was 43, he'd acted on that calcium score and, and changed his diet, had stopped smoking? Better still, what if, at age 39, when his father had his first heart attack, or at age 35, he had a coronary calcium score and had imaging and had changed his diet and stopped smoking and started to exercise? Would all of this happen? I don't think so. So here's another happier tale. This is this, the same coronary calcium score, scoring I showed you earlier. It's actually possible to go through all these slices, count up the number of pixels of calcium, and get a score. Um, this is a gentleman now that I've known since he was a teenager. I took care of his mother who had premature coronary disease, meaning she had a heart attack at a young age. He came to see me at age 45 at the urging of his wife because he had hypertension. His cholesterol was high despite taking statin drugs. His blood pressure was 170 over 102. Uh, and he was in a stressful job and not eating well. Uh, we worked with him. He didn't change much. Uh, he came back at age 51, largely at the, again at the urging of his wife. He had... Uh, not felt well lately, uh, and so we said, let's get another calcium score. So his calcium score at a, and when he first presented at 45 was two. It was very reassuring, very low. But now, at age 51, his calcium score was 1,263. As you saw, he had calcium all over. Zero is a normal score. That's what you're born with. Few of us keep it. Zero to 100 is low risk. 103 to 300 is moderate risk. Over uh, 300 to 1,000 is quite high, and over 1,000 is extraordinary. So you can go, all of you can do this if you have your coronary calcium score. You can go to, there we go, to the multi ethnic study of atherosclerosis website, and you can pull up their algorithm for calculating risk, and this is what we do for our patients. Uh, it's easy available on the internet. You can plug in all of these boxes, male, 51, calcium score, Caucasian, et cetera, et cetera, and come up with the risk of a coronary heart event in the next 10 years. That means dying suddenly of a heart attack, heart attack, bypass surgery, hospitalization, stroke, uh, uh, stent, all of that, and his risk, 31.7%.
He had one daughter who had graduated college, another who was in college. He wanted to walk his daughters down the aisle. He wanted to be a grandfather. This got his attention. And so he uh, had the talk, which I sometimes call to myself the vegan conversion conversation. And we went over a homework assignment, which all of you were given, which I use very frequently for patients to give them information about, that isn't just me, information that's on the internet, uh, YouTube, Netflix, books, websites. And he, with his wife, went and uh, accessed all that information. And three months later, he had lost 30 pounds, his blood pressure was 110, his cholesterol was down to 143. He changed his life for his family. And it was simple. This test costs, the calcium score costs anywhere from 99 to 200 bucks. You lie down, it's low radiation, you take a deep breath, and you have the information. The ultrasound is usually paid for by insurance or Medicare. It's harmless and easy to do. <clears throat> now everybody is unique. Here are some examples. How many of you have had lifeline screening studies done? A few of you, I'm surprised it's not more. They do a good job with parts of what they do. Imaging carotids with ultrasound is a qualitative exam, but they do identify plaque accurately. They image the abdomen for aneurysms. They do that pretty well. But they leave out the most important test, which is a coronary artery calcium score, evidence of coronary heart disease. Here is a lady who had a terrible family history. Her sister, her mother both had um, bypass surgery. Her father died at a young age of a heart attack. If he, she had just had lifeline screening and her aorta was normal and her carotid was normal, she might think she beat the odds in her family. But look at her calcium score. If you do that, that MESA calculation I showed you, her risk is 18%. This got her attention. Here's another fellow that I was sure was going to have uh, widespread plaque in his arteries, high cholesterol. He was a bodybuilder. He injected himself with testosterone for years, every week. He told me once that for lunch that day, he'd had a salami and liverwurst sandwich. I was convinced that he would have disease everywhere, and he had none. His risk was 3% with that age and those cholesterol numbers and so forth. Here's a patient who had extremely low cholesterol all his life. He had an elevated calcium score and had, had a uh, heart attack. How about high HDL? Doctor, my ratio is great. My HDL is over 100. I'll live forever. Not so. This person had a 30% carotid obstruction. and. If you don't look everywhere, you won't find aortic disease. Here's someone with high cholesterol, but severe narrowing of the aorta and the abdomen. Now, people always ask me, can you make this plaque go away? The answer is not completely, but somewhat. Uh, this can be done with lowering the LDL cholesterol, and it's been done in, in, in trials called asteroid and glagoff. I'll, sh I'll show you one of these because I think it's great how they image these arteries. And the lifestyle studies of Dr. Ornish and Dr. Esselstyn show that you can do it that way as well. In the asteroid trial where they used high-dose statin drugs, we, they used these neat little Doppler wires, tiny little wires inside coronary arteries. These arteries are only one to three millimeters and they cause, cause all this mischief. But you spin this, this probe and it takes a picture of the inside of the artery and this is a normal one. But here you see this rind of atherosclerotic plaque, much like one of those slides I showed you. And here you see plaque that's eccentric, even though in the angiogram the artery looks like it's of uniform caliber. Here's normal at that arrow. Here's a whole bunch of plaque over here. And you can examine the arteries in many different sections uh, before treatment and after treatment and show that in some patients, well, in, in, this, in this trial, half the patients progressed with their 
artery narrowing and half regressed. And the other trial, which lowered LDL cholesterol even further down to 30, two-thirds regressed and one-third progressed. There's still residual risk. Um, here is Dr. Esselstyn's study. This image has been shown here before, I know. Uh, here's one of his patients before and after treatment. Uh, here's his left anterior descending coronary artery before. You can see how regular and obstructed it is after the, his dietary intervention. This is an image showing perfusion of blood in the left ventricle, and it went from very poor perfusion to much improved perfusion. So it can be done either way. Sometimes you need both. What about with drugs? Uh, the very first study of statins is pri in primary pre prevention. People who have never had a heart attack or heart event was the West of Scotland study, WASCOPS. We call it, it was done in the West of Scotland because the men there had a very high prevalence of risk factors. Uh, they smoked, they were diabetic, they were obese, they ate, a, they ate a terrible diet, they were hypertensive, you could get an answer in a short period of time. Pravastatin was the statin that was used. And these patients were followed. The people who, who didn't take the medications were not counted. Nurses called the patients frequently to make sure they complied. So this is the best of all possible worlds. And the risk reduction here was 30%. Death from coronary heart disease, 28% risk reduction. Not 50%, not 100%. Here is a compendium of studies of, of statin drugs and atherosclerosis on prevention of future events. Here's 13 studies looking at mortality. Here's total cardiovascular events, and what you can see is there's 14%, 25%, uh, 27%, etc. We get 25% risk reduction from using medicines. But in trials where diet is assessed with questionnaires, if you compare the worst diet to the best diet, the worst 20% to the best 20% in a sort of a dose-ranging study, what do you find? Going back to one of the original Adventist studies in 1978, 50% risk reduction going forward. Health professionals, women's health, nurses' health, thousands of patients. Just these studies alone are 225,000 patients. And look at the amount of risk reduction that's achieved. And a lifestyle, if you combine exercise, which reduces risk 50%, if you, with, with uh, diet change. And look at the effect that it has in reducing the incidence of diabetes. I like this, this study. This is just one of many because of the title, Healthy Living is the Best Revenge. Uh, there was 78% reduction, risk reduction in any chronic condition. There was 80% reduction in heart attack. There was 36% reduction in the incidence of cancer. Over 90% reduction in the emergence of diabetes. You can't beat that. So how efficacious are various treatments in primary prevention? Medicines, 25%. Procedures really have no place in primary prevention. Exercise, 50%. Real food. You know what it is, 50%, and total lifestyle, at least 75% risk reduction without ever having to come to see me. How many of you heard about the Simani uh, Indian tribe in the, Am in the Amazon? A few of you? Okay. This is very instructive. Uh, there's a project studying these pre-industrial people who live in the upper Amazon, 16,000 of them who live in small groups. Uh, they live in small groups, family groups, in open huts. They farm, they gather, they farm mostly maize and, and uh, manioc or cassava and rice. They hunt a little bit, they fish, but 74% of their diet is complex carbohydrates that they grow or gather. 
14 percent is uh, uh, protein, and the rest is fat. They're on their feet 90 percent of the time during the day, 17,000 steps a day average. And they have a lot of inflammation because tuberculosis is fairly common in this group. Uh, they're infested, 70% of them, with intestinal parasites, hookworm. And, the, and a project was undertaken to find out if all this inflammation led to artery disease. They took 700 of these people many miles upriver to a town that had a CT scanner. Their hunting, as you can see, is very primitive, although they've got shotguns now. So what did they find? Well, just look at age, approximately age 70 here. 72% of these people had no calcium at age 70. Of those in the Mesa study, 40% here in Los Angeles, half that number had no calcium in their arteries. A tremendous difference based on just lifestyle. I'm going to skip ahead here, I think. Oh, I love this one. Um, and just in the interest of time, I'm going to skip ahead. Uh, we have the gastrointestinal system that has evolved uh, with agriculture to eat primarily plants. There are many differences between what a carnivore looks like, think of your dog or your cat, and what a human alimentary tract looks like. From the way our lips are shaped, our mouth, to what our teeth do in grinding, to how our esophagus works, the acidity in our stomach, the length we need of a gastrointestinal tract, very short in a dog, two times the trunk length, because the dog is designed to eat meat, in an acid environment in the stomach and dissolve all the protein quickly and full, fully digest in two to four hours. But for us, it takes 12 to 24 hours to digest because we're extracting all these nutrients over a much larger surface area, much longer gut, uh, uh, because it's plant material out of which we have to extract all of these nutrients. And why do we have a colon? Is it just to house these 10 trillion organisms, more, more organisms than cells in our body? Or is it because they need to digest what's left over from meat? No. Is it because they need to help absorb extra virgin olive oil? No, it's because they extract nutrition from fiber. Fiber is nothing more than complex carbohydrates that our own system cannot digest. Uh, and this leads me to segue into it into just a little side story about the funniest lecture of this type on diet I ever was a, was privileged to witness it was many years ago when I was in training and a lecturer came to Johns Hopkins to present work on fiber very curious at the time he was a, a, an Irishman, a very uh, pluckish, funny fellow who was born into a very religious family. He was very devout all of his life uh, and believed, Dennis Burkett believed, that God had chosen him to help serve others. So he trained to be a physician. And during World War II, he was uh, assigned to a post in Africa of all places. He fell in love with the continent. After he got out of service, he requested a mission assignment to a mission hospital. There were hundreds in Africa, and he wound up in Uganda. And he, um, very shortly after arrival, noticed that there were certain kinds of, certain kinds of tumors in children that caused swelling of the face, and he biopsied them. It was a brand new uh, type of lymphoma which he reported in the English literature and others confirmed and it became known as Burkitt's lymphoma. Every medical student, every doctor knows that name, Dennis Burkitt and Burkitt's lymphoma. He studied the geographical distribution of the disease because he wanted to know, uh, is it just, just located in one tribe? Is it genetic 
or uh, is it a region somehow, some pathogen? And what he found was not only was there some demographics about uh, this tumor that were interesting, confined almost exclusively to Africa, but there were many diseases in, in uh, Great Britain that didn't exist in Africa. Hemorrhoids, gastroesophageal reflux, uh, uh, diverticulitis, colon cancer, uh, and coronary heart disease. He surveyed all the mission hospitals and coronary heart disease was almost unheard of and he believed it was due to the amount of fiber in the diet. Uh, these natives were, were consuming you know, 100 to 150 grams of fiber and the Brits were lucky to get 10 or 12. And so uh, he proposed this as a concept, he wrote about it, he lectured about it. He came to our institution, Hopkins, very formal place. The professors dress up in three-piece suits. Uh, all of us in our dress whites, very respectful in an auditorium. And this, this pluckish guy uh, comes and he basically doesn't talk about the fiber content of maize and sorghum and beans and pumpkin, which these people eat. He follows the fiber and talks about the other end. <laughs> he had pictures from all over Africa and the Middle East asking permission of the people, could I take your picture while you poop? <laughs> and amazingly, people agreed. And he would show a picture of the person, usually not with their face, doing what comes naturally to people all around the world in the proper position to poop. A, co a commode is not the proper position. And then he would take a picture of the poop. And he would usually juxtapose the African poop with the poop of some British matronly lady that was a couple of small rocks. <laughs> and he did this on and on for an hour. And I, I have never laughed so hard. I've never had such source. But everybody was hysterical. And this never happened at Hopkins, ever. And he was famous for aphorisms. Uh, one, one here is that America is a constipated nation, and if you have small stools, you have large hospitals. And it's basically true. If you did nothing but follow the fiber, if you only ate foods that had a high fiber content and you got 100 grams of fiber a day, you would be eating a plant-based, real food diet. Okay. Now, to wind up, how do, once identifying somebody that would benefit from this information, what do we do in our practice? We've got to overcome some practical obstacles. We've got to remain positive. Pastor Jensen uh, has talked here before about um, being positive, a positive message, helping people go in increments toward a better lifestyle and a better diet. You have to focus their attention. Well, a calcium score over a thousand will focus your attention. The death of somebody in your family or a friend from heart disease will focus your attention. Then you have to overcome ingrained beliefs and the image of vegetarians and vegans, long-haired hippies wearing Birkenstocks. You know how it goes. At that point, I usually drop some names. Have you ever heard of Serena Williams? Ever heard of Joachim Djokovic, tennis players? Tom Brady, arguably the best quarterback in the history of the game. And isn't he married to that beautiful supermodel? Yes. Yes. Um, the winner of the Los Angeles Marathon here recently, a Kenyan. Kipchoge, the Kenyan who just broke his own world record in Berlin with a marathon of, of two hours and, and one minute. Incredible time. I ran marathons at one point in the past before I figured out that at 220 pounds that you it wasn't a good idea for your hips and knees. But these canyons, they're all vegetarians. So I can get past that. There's some distracting headlines like butter is better, bacon is back, and things like that you have to get past. And then you have to avoid negative terms. That's why I find talking to people about real food and how simple it is, is the easiest and most positive way to proceed. But diet 
is kind of a dirty word. It has four letters. And it's negative. Diet is about don't. It's about failure. Too many people have tried diets and failure. Nutrition has been co-opted by the big food. You know, no GMO, no sugar, a good source of calcium. It's all confusing. Uh, lower fat and cholesterol, less saturated fat. That was terrible advice. If you were here the first night, do you remember that graph that, that uh, Dr. Deal showed in 1970 and the incidence of diabetes and obesity going up, up, up? That was after we told people to lower the fat and cholesterol in the diet. And what did they do? Processed carbohydrates. That's where they got their calories. Where is the, the low trans fat aisle in the market? You know, my patients go to the market to look for food. Uh, they read a menu to, to decide what kind of food they eat, not kind of, what kind of trans fats. Avoiding processed foods. Doctor, aren't all, all foods processed? More whole foods. Doctor, I had a whole steak last night. <laughs> and it is a good source of nutrition, but not the one for you. More plant-based. Doctor, I'm more plant-based. I'm eating more salads. No. The energy comes from whole grains and legumes. It doesn't come. Phytonutrients come from, from uh, leaves, but, but uh, not the energy you need to be a Tom Brady. And then the homework assignment. I found this to be very effective. I have typical doctor's handwriting, and uh, it, it's a long homework assignment, and nobody can read it. But I give this to you as just an illustration of how we use this resource. Uh, we recommend that people get a basic overview. That's a website that I created. And then there are, you can watch things on YouTube, on Netflix. Uh, there are websites. And I check off the ones I think that are most impor important for this particular patient. There are ones on diabetes, like Neil Barnard's book and his website. Uh, tremendous for patients who have diabetes and want to have this kind of, uh, of lifestyle change and so forth. And then there are cooking websites and cookbooks. I like the cooking websites because they show you a nice picture and simple ingredients, etc. Uh, and they'll, you can sign up and they'll send you recipes uh, every once in a while. And then I insist that everyone go to the American Institute of Cancer Research site and learn about cancer and diet. It's so important. I have a calcium score, at least the last time I checked, of zero. Jill uh, is after me to get my calcium score checked again, and I'll do it. But as far as I know, I don't have any atherosclerosis. I do this diet because of the risk of cancer. And it's very real, and there's a lot of information there. So I hope our little discussion here has led you to understand that heart attack and stroke can be prevented, that everyone should be screened for early disease. It's the best way to prevent these terrible events from occurring. And all men should be screened by 45, all women by 55 and earlier if you have any risk factors. And that you know the, the significance of the numbers. 75% of all heart attacks and strokes are first ever events. Medicines only reduce risk by 25%, but you get 50% risk reduction from simple things, the right diet, exercise, and lifestyle. And real food, a plant-based diet and lifestyle are the most powerful treatments we have for these diseases. And I hope you have enough confidence to be an advocate to your family, your friends, your community to help everybody change. It isn't going to come from us from doctors. We're, we're in the position we were with tobacco 60 years ago. It's going to come from you and your efforts as, as customers and consumers and advocates to those you know to make a real difference. So I'll end there and turn it back to, to John. <laughs>